Hello and welcome to what is the third part of uh, mine and Steve's sort of countdown of top five films that have influenced us. So first and foremost, hello Steve, how are you keeping? Yeah, good, yeah, um, another fine day. Uh, what are we in? Nine weeks now, I think, in um, social, isol- so- social isolation. Um, <laughs> Say that with a drink. Yeah, I know, um, but it's been, it's actually gone really pop quickly for me. Uh, I, th- I had a couple of moments early on where it was a bit anxious and... But, um, you know, I've kind of gone to groove. We've always got stuff to do work-wise, family-wise. Um, my son, we've been homeschooling, which has turned out to be just total respect for teachers. I knew they had a tough job, but, you know, when you have to sit down and do them, it's really, really a hard job. So, yeah, it's good. Yeah, no, but... I, know. I, I know how hard it must be. I, I've met your son. I know how hard it must be. <laughs> <laughs> he is hard work. He's clever, but he's hard work. Um, but, you know, it's just, it is what it is. just got to get on with it. I mean... There's a, a kind of, I suppose, not the beginning of the end, but you could say the end of the beginning, as, as Churchill famously said, this is like a hopefully a bit of a chink of light at the end of the tunnel now, but just got to be so careful. You know, I just worry what we come out of this too quickly. Um, but it's changing slowly, and here in the UK, the figures are slightly getting slightly better. Um, but, you know, yeah, we've been busy. Uh, doing lots of stuff on the web and doing these fun podcasts, which people have been listening to. We've had more than five. I think we've had six people. So, uh, <laughs> so 15%. Well, that's the thing, actually. Going, I was listening to a podcast earlier, um, and it was actually Martin Comston from Line of Duty, oh, the yeah. British show, which obviously you'll be aware of. And he was just saying, he lives out in Las Vegas, and he was just saying, you know what? Does he? Las Vegas? He's just enjoying yeah, he's out in Vegas with his wife and he's saying he's just enjoying the downtime because as a working actor, he does a lot of indie films, but then he's found his way into more mainstream projects. He's just had The Nest that was on BBC. Mm. And funnily enough, actually, the person that was then doing the podcast is Thomas Turgoose, who was also an indie actor, but you'll know him as the young lad Sean in This Is England. Um if you've seen, obviously, the Shane Meadows film. And he was just saying, yeah. this is a nice time. Normally, when he goes off to work, this is Mark Compton, oh, I go off to work, I have to say goodbye to my like partner and that, and you head away. Whereas now, they're actually at home. He's, he's not thinking about the, the next script or lines he's got to learn. Mm. And some people are... It's almost come as a welcome retreat. Obviously, what's happening on a global scale is... It's, it's, terrifying in a way oh, but for dreadful. some people they're able to take a step back and go oh okay I mean very much when they started I was still as I had just been when we finished the London Festival I think I'd give Tom Hanks a run for his money because I've not I'm letting the uh, hair and the beard grow uh, <laughs> wiry and as long as I can let it get <laughs> well actually today uh, I would actually have been physically returned I would have got home from Valencia today in fact just about now uh, probably catching the ferry over yeah, from, from yeah yeah you would wouldn't you yeah yeah, yeah. it would have been today I, yeah the plan would have been that I would have been flying back yesterday so as you know Valencia um, I've been in communication with the venue obviously we're monitoring etc we're hoping we're going to be able to get to Valencia for October and of course we made the announcement last week on the social media and we'll then be following up uh, probably tomorrow with an email out to if I'm referencing our West Europe festival whereas we've had to make a decision based on the current climate in Belgium that that festival will be returning with for 2021. Um, all the submissions today are still set to be as part of that submission pool. So again, it's about adapting and changing. Um, and again, something which is fun for us, obviously what we're going to round up. So obviously we started with our initial Looking Back podcast. We've then one which is out there now is our countdown of our films in fifth and fourth place. Um, Soon enough, then, people would have heard the films that we rank third and second. And at this podcast, it's just us giving a little bit of time to what we'd consider to be sort of the number one film. Not necessarily the best film, but the film which has inspired and left a lasting impression on Steve and I. So, Steve, over to you. Take the floor. Cheers. Um, This was really quite easy for me. Um, And this film, which obviously I'll get on to in a moment, um, is one that you cannot... It's very difficult to argue that this isn't uh, a masterpiece. Um, it's been, uh, I think it's one of those uh, defining films. Uh, I think it's, it's gone into the, um, there's a, a US registry of, of outstanding films have been kept for historical purposes. This is in there. Um, right. And um, came out in 1979, uh, a couple of clues. Uh, the, the director of the film had only made one feature before. He'd been very heavily involved in um, 
adverts, a Hovis advert is quite famous for, directed episodes, I think, of Z Cars. And the film he'd done before that is The Duelist, um, which a lot of people will know and instantly know the director I'm talking about. Um, and the reason I've chosen Alien, obviously that film, is, as I said, you can't argue that it is an incredible film. Um, and unlike a couple of the other films which I mentioned, um, this is... You're so- keeping up your reputation as sci-fi, Steve. <laughs> So defi- well, it's so defining for all sorts of reasons. I can remember seeing this film. I was probably, uh, yes, I came out in 1979, and I think I saw this when I was 14, or maybe 15, I think it was 14, and um, it was actually on one of the first generation videos. It was a pirate copy, I shouldn't really be saying that, and it was a top-loading video. Um, so what I must have been very early video recorded in the UK, so it was a grainy copy, um, and I remember seeing this friend's house, or his bedroom, um, the curtains closed and it was one summer's day and it was I'd never experienced anything like it and it had a profound effect on me um, everything about it, I mean small things I, I became very interested in classical music because of this film it's a piece by Mozart in a short excerpt mm. that's a small thing cinematography which now even now looks incredible uh, the way that um, uh, the film the way Ridley Scott put this together the, the stunning design by H.R. Giga um, the the editing of the film, the whole look of the film with Ron Cobb, the, the production design, Nick Alder, and ironically, I actually rented a house of Nick Alder's mum, a uh, flat when I was uh, much younger. He won an Oscar, of course, for Alien, oh. uh, along with Gig. Yeah, that's just a pure coincidence. Um, and it even now, obviously, I've got I've got it on Blu-ray. Um, it's, it's probably the that. And the, the Ultra HD version, you'll never find a better looking version. The film probably as good as going to the cinema. Uh, and it scared the hell out of me. And at the same time, oh, in fact, the imagery, particularly of I know the, it's very spare imagery of the alien, um, I suppose it, it terrifies me. And I, um, I found it um, attractive at the same time. It's very difficult to explain. Um, but it was an incredible film. It, stand, it has stood the test of time. And yeah, it genuinely is is my my favourite film. There's a couple of facts about this um, film. I could be like a spinner. The alien, sorry, just to jump in, the alien took like human, obviously, alien takes human form, yet lacks any traits of a human. It doesn't uh, have an emotion. It's obvious that merge between monster and then obviously. Obviously, the aliens a character, and then obviously, the, I think the ships a character as well. Well, the Nostro- in terms of yeah, okay. So the the, the funnily enough, the, the the ship in um, in the in Alien, the original Alien, is the Nostromo, and the escape pod is the Narcissus, and both of them, Nostromo is actually is the title of a Joseph Conrad novel. Um, whereas the escape pod Narcissus is always well, I can't say what the full title is because it's offensive, but. Um, it's um, it's very well known as well, but actually with the alien, um, it's uh, what well, they well H.R. Uh, Giger was very new. Was sorry, his design was what was called biomechanical, so he used to fuse organic and inorganic material to come as really weird designs. And um, I think it was Dan O'Bannon or Ron Shusha who originally wrote wrote or co-writers on the original draft alien, which was originally called Star Beast, funny enough. But anyway. Um, when they were looking for a design, um, they took well, Ridley Scott was obviously because he knew the film would would make or break on the design, the look of the the alien. And I can't remember which one of them showed him a book by Giga called I think it was Necronomicon. And as soon as he saw it, he went, "Yeah, this is." He instantly knew he'd he'd hit the nail on the head. But the funny thing is, <clears throat> with this, that when they um, uh, when Ridley Scott got the gig to direct the film. Um, and it was all, a lot of this was done on the strength of Star Wars. If it hadn't been Star Wars, they, 20th Century Fox probably wouldn't have greenlit this because they'd had a massive hit with Star Wars and of course they wanted to follow that up and that was the only kind of sci-fi film script on the table. Um, and they, yeah. they So it's all pure luck and they yeah, went with it. But the, the way, the, the funding for it was, I think it was $4 million that he was given as a budget, which is 90, well, it was 1978, I suppose, they started actually making the film, which is quite a lot of money. But he knew he wanted more, so he actually did the, and you can check this, it's quite a famous story, he actually um, did the, um, uh, what do they call it, not the set, the, uh, he'd done the, he'd done the drawings um, for it, the, um, oh, okay. yeah, the, the name escapes me. Story, he'd done the story, yeah, the storyboarding. Done the storyboarding. Storyboarding, yeah, yeah that's yeah. his story, I should, I should know that. So he storyboarded it, and the 20th Century Fox execs on the strength of that doubled the budget to $8 million. So that's how good he was as, as, a, as an artist. 
Um, but yeah, everything sort of seemed to come together for the film. And obviously, Sigourney Weaver it was a ticket to superstardom. An alien heroine, which had, uh, sorry, and a, a, a heroine of a film which was um, very unusual at the time, female um, heroine. Absolutely. I love how the crew didn't really get on as well, though. Like That was just another factor. Not only, obviously, the crew weren't overly friendly, and then it is basically it's an elaborate version of Cat and Mouse and Survival of the Fittest. It is. It? That's well, as it's, it's always been it, yeah. said elsewhere. But, it is. A, it's an and Agatha Christie film. it's a formula that works. Yeah, it is. Yeah. You, you have not, is. seven or eight people, and they get n- knocked off, killed one by one by by the alien. But, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, um, I, Harry Dean Stanton... I mean, famously, you know, yeah. with Ridley Scott said we want you to be in this film, and, and Harry Dean Stanton said, "I don't know what this film is. You haven't told me this. Oh, I don't do horror films, and I don't do science fiction." And, I, and I, yeah, and he and he said, "What is it?" And he said, "Oh, it's a horror film. It's a science fiction." Um, but obviously, he managed to persuade him to, or worse to that effect, to do the film. Um, and because Victoria, uh, Veronica Cartwright, she'd been given the green light to um, she thought she was going to be playing the Ripley character, and I think up until that point she probably was, and then. They screen tested um, Sigourney Weaver really at the last minute, and she got the part. And then when Ver- Veronica Cartwright turned up to film, they, she realised she didn't have the lead. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. But there's, yeah, there's so many amazing things about this film uh, stories. It all just—it's just one of those sort of lightning in a bottle that you know very difficult to repeat. And a lot of people will say well, Aliens is better. Aliens is a, an incredible, stunning sequel that's very close to being as good as and I know it's like almost like oh, I don't know Vietnam in space but for me it still stands out as the the the, um, the best film that Ridley Scott's made and it's a shame actually because that and um, Blade Runner and he's done a couple of other brilliant films Prometheus um, and Alien Covenant were really disappointing and you kind of think you can be I was going to say really that's good. the thing they try and keep they try and keep the characters in Hollywood, even if you're looking and going Freddy versus Jason in the like, late 2000s. Obviously, those stories, and then when it was Alien versus Predator. Oh, um, Jesus, just so bad. And what ultimately, that's that's Hollywood just trying to desperate for cash. Sort of capture the de- desperate for cash, capturing the imagination of an audience which is already bought in. Like you were saying, you're going to watch every Star Wars film that comes out because you're invested in the franchise. And again like Alien and I remember people still look now and you see these complicated artworks for films and people go you know what keep it simple look at this and Alien is is a although you can see different variations but the illuminating the green oh the lighting and then, uh, the set design I mean there's so many things but you're right oh, I mean, yeah, yeah. it's unreal I mean it, it was it was made to look claustrophobic and I believe Ridley Scott when they filled the, built the first sets he said no I want you to make them smaller so that it was more claustrophobic and a couple of other inter- you know another interesting thing that springs to mind there's the famous scene where they first encounter the engineer um, who's like um, almost morphed into the, this chair um, and in order to make the engineer look bigger uh, than he actually was, they actually used children in mini- in spaces so miniaturised it to make the engineer look b- bigger and actually one of the children was really Scott's son. People, a lot of people probably know that's a true story um, and uh, yeah you can just look at it now you know especially in, in HD or Ultra HD and it still looks astounding. It's influenced so many films as is Blade Runner. I mean uh, you know, they are probably, well, I'm certain that they are the pinnacle of, I mean, so it's a, one of those running jokes they use for Orson Welles, you know, Ridley Scott t- started at the top and worked his way to the bottom, because really they were his two defining yeah. films, and, you know, he, uh, they, he has done other great films, he's done Gladiator, of course, and, and, other, and other stuff, um, but, you know, it's it's a shame, it's, uh, the, uh, and the ironic thing about this film is if you watch it for about 45, 50 minutes, nothing happens. Um, and you'd never get away with that now if you was to make a film, if you was to go in with a script and go, yeah, nothing happens 45 minutes, you'd never get the gig um, because everyone wants it wham, bam, you know, straight away. And, and But what it did do is it ratcheted up the tension, built it slowly, and of course by the time it all kicks off with a face hugger um, when they go into the derelict ship, and then from there on it's just bang, 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 relentless. Um, and it is uh, an astounding film. I mean, um, my partner has not seen it. She won't see it. She won't watch it. A film which which did do that and I always remember it was the first Mad Max with Mel Gibson no like the whole film you're watching it and you're terrified and you're going oh my god and that whole apocalyptic world and then actually you go oh nothing happens until the final scene and again the, the ability of 
Hollywood films been able to do that. And of course, now just flipping back into Alien, the John Hurt scene, oh, no incredible. one else knew, did they? No, they didn't. No, that's, but, that is a true story. And the the, um, the expression you see on Veronica Cartwright's face was best blood, and she's terrified. That is all real. Um, and no, yeah, I mean, no one knew. It, it obviously kept it very quiet about what he was going to do on set. Um, and yeah, it's just an extraordinary film and it literally was as i said earlier the beginning one being it was it, it changed how i looked at films because for before that yeah i've seen star wars and i know that was one of my films that i had in my top five as was jaws but in terms of a guttural response to a film that could never be equaled maybe with the exorcist um although that won't be my top five wouldn't be my top five um but it still for me stands head and shoulders above any other film i've ever seen um and just does it make you jump from, if you watch it now, does no, it still? No, does no, it, it doesn't have, make, so no. It's a, so it's lost. It's that's the thing there for me. Films still need to have that factor. Um, no, it hasn't lost it. You've seen it so many times. No, it doesn't make me jump. But what it does do actually is um, uh, and, uh, something which is I have carried with me is I still do dream occasionally about these the alien creatures, xenomorph, whatever you want to call it. So I I have had some vivid dreams and most dreams you forget, but there's a couple I can remember that that creature was in it. So it's it's obviously affecting me my psyche. Um and is yeah. it's it's actually embedded itself so deeply into my conscious and subconscious and, and um, you know, I would implore anyone that hasn't seen it, there's not many people that have seen it, watch it on a, the biggest screen you can and watch it in home cinema, watch it in, in H D and turn all the lights off and just you know, yeah, I mean, the sound and the visuals yeah, just are amazing. creates the eerie, dark sort of, yes, setting. And you do, it's, a, it's a film that you do need to immerse yourself in. That's not one where you're going to go, I'll tell you what, I'll just watch this on my phone on no, like a seven-inch screen or whatever. And just, yeah, it's, certain cinema needs to be seen uh, in certain environments. And actually saying that, um, so Mark Salter, as we know, and I did share with you earlier, when he'd listened to the first uh, edition of part of the podcast, and he then actually sent a picture of where he'd seen uh, Blade Runner, which yeah, was in a, uh, yeah, sort of a lovely setting. And that's the sort of environment you look and go, yeah, that's where a film like that should be seen. Yeah, should it be is. Enjoyed. I mean, there's uh, me saying I saw it on a grainy um, part of video in 1980, but obviously I went then, then saw it in all its glory. But actually seeing it like that probably made it scary because, you know, it was very difficult to see what was going on, even more difficult. Um, and I was young, I was a kid, um, and as I said, it's um, it, it's hard to describe um, how affecting that film was in terms of as a child seeing that. Uh, and I remember, you know, it, it, it seriously affects me in the way I because I then realised because um, I've always been interested in film, but then I ultimately realised actually film can do that. You know, it can you know, and, and that had already happened with as I say with Jaws and Star Wars kind of in a lesser way, um, so defining most of my life, but to see that like that um, was just, or see that film was terrifying and ex exalting at the same time, because all of a sudden, you know, there was a film that came along that was so different and so mesmerizing and so um, scary and beautiful and different and crazy all at the same time that, it, you know, it really made a massive difference to the way I wanted to look at film so yeah that's it and that's it last last, last year it celebrated its uh, 40th year of cinema and still you would say stands the test of time and that's yeah. what's important with Full cinema years, is yeah. that you can go of course people can look and go I remember the older ones of the Sunday afternoon film to Jason and the Argonauts with the plasticine they're the sort <laughs> of films you look and go cool wow they look old but a film like Alien 40 years on it still, still looks watchable. incredible. Yeah, it is, and he got it because yeah. he got it. He got it so right with, um, you know, like they weren't. They were kind of, well, they were truckers in space. A lot of people say, and they were just ordinary people. It's got a wonderful defense mechanism. You don't dare kill it. There was no mm -hmm. standout, like good-looking person. A lot, a lot of the people in it were unknowns at the time. As I said, Gorney Weaver, Veronica Cartwright, um, were quite. I think uh, Gorney Weaver done one or two films before but smaller roles I think Veronica Carter had been invaded from the Body Snatchers a year before um, so Harry Dean Stanton was kind of known Yafit Koto, Koto was from um, Live and Let Die he was a bad in it but a lot of them and Ian Holm of course I mean Ian Holm's performance in that was, was oh, yeah. staggering um, he'd been he'd done a few films um, and you know but overall it's hard to sort of you can't get away from the fact that it's a stunning film and you, it's very difficult to argue that it isn't one of 
the great films ever made for all sorts of reasons. But yeah, no, that's it. That's my numero uno. So over to you, Dan. Over to me. Well, as every sort of film writer, um, I'm going to build a bit of climax. I'm going to give a bit of sort of background story to it and then before a reveal and then obviously go into the reasons. So in 1987, there was a writer called Jeb Stewart and he was looking for his next payday and he'd had some connection with 20th Century Fox, so the same outlet, and he contacted Lloyd Levin, who was the head of development there, and Lloyd Levin had been wanting to get a novel adaptation launched, and the novel adaptation, in 1968, there was a film called The Detective, with Frank Sinatra, which was an adaptation of a Roderick Thorpe novel, and the sequel to that was called Nothing Lasts Forever. And this was a film that Levin wanted to turn into a film. And he got Jeb Stewart to work on it and work on it and eventually develop the idea. Then eventually they, uh, it's Gordon, I think, was the head at 20th Century Fox. Um, he got Joel Silver um, on board and Joel Silver had been working on just recently Commando, etc. So Joel Silver came on board, met Jeb Stewart and said... There's nothing wrong with you, but you're going to get fired. In fact, you're fired. And they got rid of him. <laughs> he then brought in Stephen DeSouza, who had then done 48 hours, had done The Running Man, had done Commando. And the reason he brought him in, he said, I need to work with someone I know. Mm. And Joel Silver had always wanted to make a film with a certain title. And that title was Die Hard. So there's the background. And my number one film that has influenced me is John McTiernan's 1988 film, Die Hard. Um, going back to the title reference, that actually came from Shane Black, who done Lethal Weapon, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Predator as Shane well. Shane Black. I think Predator. Of course, with, yes. With John McTiernan, I think he directed that as well, didn't he? I think. No, that's so. Yeah, John McTiernan had done those, but Shane Black, um, Die Hard was the original title of The Last Boy Scout. Was which it? Bruce Willis I didn't know then that. starred. Oh, right, okay. yeah, th- wow. yeah, that was the original one in 1991. So. In the build-up, the um, the detective, where it starred Frank Sinatra, he was given first refusal on any project which acted as a sequel from the detective. So obviously, nothing lasts forever. Actually, had your terrorists in it. Uh, the characters of uh, the, the bad guy was Gruber. You then had Gennaro, which uh, obviously Bruce Willis' his wife's name. They went to Frank Sinatra and said, "We've got this," and his response was no i'm too old and i'm too rich so (laughs) he (laughs) so he turned down what is die hard and then they were then looking for their lead and the film had gone out to eastwood it had gone out to they believe it was actually written for richard Gere, and then it went out to Al al pacino and then eventually they were looking at Bruce Willis, who'd been jumping on things with Moonlighting. I think he'd just released Blind Date, and it had flopped. Tanked, yeah, that tanked, didn't it, was, it? Yeah. Yeah, same as Hudson Hawk. Um, but it was a case of, right, this guy here, and then all of a sudden, he had a bit of a gap in between his filming uh, with Moonlighting. They went, okay, let's go for it. And the thing that I love about Die Hard, it is a film for me that, Read, it came out the, uh, in 88. So again, I was one, of course, I wasn't like you at the cinema scene. It was a film that I watched years later, but it holds personal nostalgia because if ever it's on TV, I'd sit and watch it with my dad and we'd know it line for line. And even if you know at the festivals, I'll reel off Die Hard, <laughs> Yippie Kaye, to the Happy Trail Hands, to Welcome to the Party Pal. It's constant and I love it. And I love... The whole character of John McClane is the fact that he's a modern-day cowboy, yet he doesn't have a hat or a horse. Yeah. And that whole emotion, he he bleeds for real. It's not like your Rambos um, and, say, the Commando films just come out prior to it. He's he's not big and bulky with the muscles. And it was adding that humour into a script of action and the one-man army that just, for me, it really did sort of redefine the genre. and And I think almost the basis of... Steven Seagal and his Jean-Claude Van Damme oh yeah it influenced so many films careers of course before there there was the Rambo films where it is the one man army Slim obviously Alien again you've got the baddies but it was just the whole 
the casting and even going to and again although people probably are aware of this Steven Dezauser was there and he was looking I think he had the meeting with John McTiernan and going yeah we need to find the building and they looked outside and went well there's the Fox Plaza and the Fox Plaza became the Nakatomi Plaza that's right and how much money did they save doing that for the exteriors it was amazing because they actually did have there was there was floors under construction in the in which were out of use now I, I've actually got a massive um, encyclopedia of the sort of the visual history of Die Hard which I've always loved and it's got but they're saying there's people in there that were working and going oh my god they're in here filming um, and it, even looking back then the helicopters on the top of the roof that was just sort of a little remote control helicopter painted yeah. to look and the real sort of fire and explosions but seeing seeing this project which you could just sit there and watch and the Bruce Willis character primarily one location and it's then just the different floors and it was and although they've released it since and of course I played it to death like a computer game I know they then came out of the raid which is of uh see different versions but again it's retelling the same story and of the one man I mean of course for you did you see it when it came out in the cinema was that so much you I was thinking about this actually did I see Die Hard at the cinema I think I saw on home video mate if I'm honest but it's one of those films which again I think when you you do watch and again let's just say it's something which has always stuck with me I know I'd say Die Hard 2 was great Die Hard 3 was great and actually Die Hard 4 the fact it was looking at the modern day terrorism cyber attacks worked the, the subsequent ones weren't for me and rumours are he's looking to come back but I'd always say say the first three but the first one um I just remember enjoying the characters so much as well, and even, say, Alan Rickman, who's the stage actor. All of you relax. This is a matter of inconvenient timing, that's all. Police action was inevitable. And, as it happens, necessary. So let them fumble about outside and stay calm. This is simply the beginning. Because his was a, an amazing story, how he got... Cause, um, how he got the, the gig as well. I know you know a lot more about this than me, but, but someone had seen him on stage or something in New York, didn't they? And, and they were like, oh, he could be perfect. Yes. But I think he turned it down, didn't he? Did yeah, he, he did it? initially. Um, as did actually John McTiernan. He did Because he? he just finished um, filming Predator in Mexico. And he was like, oh, I need some downtime. I just need to like take some time off. And he looked at the original script by Jeb Stewart. Um, and he didn't like how uh, John McClane's character was too sort of sophisticated and suave. It's like, oh, no, I'm not. It's just, it's a boring TV movie. But then they kept on going at him and going at him. Uh, this is Larry Gordon, the head of Fox, and Joel Silver. And eventually, John McTinnan was like, okay, I can look to make this work. And imagine having just done a film with Arnie in the jungle to then something now, Bruce Willis, who didn't have that reputation. Because even the artwork, originally, the original artwork, they had Bruce Willis on and then they took it off and went no this isn't going to sell we're just going to have to build him an that's explosion right. and then last minute they went no put him back on no I that's think right I there was two that's right two yeah, alternatives but, that um because there's a brilliant documentary on I think Netflix about it and I always got the impression from John McTinn and he didn't take fools you know no time for fools because he was very straight talking um and you imagine yes. he's quite you know but yeah that's right that was covered in that thing that, that they didn't want him on the artwork did they originally uh and again a bit like yeah. alien there's all these bizarre circumstances that came together to make probably what is the best action film ever made because i can't deny it is still a brilliant standout action film um but i'm quite yeah 100 percent. yeah it, i could think about i'm pretty sure i didn't see this one because i really think i would remember i mean i can remember seeing predator at the cinema for instance and that was around obviously yeah. before then um and aliens and uh, but no that doesn't stand it must have been on home video when i first saw it and i don't know why i didn't see because it, it was a ma i think it was a massive hit wasn't it yeah, initially when it came out and it was a slow burner i know that much and then obviously then when it increased and you look and think oh i mean Fox obviously playing money into it but I just again as you say action films budgets develop from your Fast and Furious and then your bigger Dwayne Johnson films when Con Air came out which is then just Die Hard or Steven Seagal Under Siege Die Hard on a boat yeah. then he does Die Hard on a train and then when Con Air come out <laughs> and again you know what Con Air is an absolute quality film that's um, cool quite love that Nicolas Cage it works it's a similar the white vest uh, John Malkovich is a great bad guy and it did you just see those carbon copies, but it's not only just because it is that standalone action, it's 
the way the the fight scenes. I mean, Alexander Gudinov, who I know passed away. Um, yeah. At a young age. He, he was, was a ballet dancer. He and was. He came in as. He was in Witness. The, that was his first sort of breakout film. Yes, that's it. Yes, he was. Yeah. And then even his uh, brother, who was cast in it, um, was another one from sort of theatrical backgrounds. So there's a few faces you look at and go, oh, hang on, I think I remember you. And they've done the circuit of action films yeah. of the 90s. And then to do the sequel and sort of the, the police officer and the fact that half the film is not wearing shoes to then the ho, 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 now of a machine gun. It was a perfect balance for me to sit and watch something where actually you're going, oh my God, I hope he doesn't get caught. But then actually it's that carbon copy. You know the one man, of course there's going to be sacrifices of people in the narrative, but it is that whole you know exactly what you're sitting down to watch. You know that there's going to be an act, there's then going to be the good guy and the bad guy, you're then going to... It's not what's going to happen, it's how it's going to happen. And at the end, in this version, he's got a gun taped to his back with Christmas sellotape and then out the window. And what's amazing with that is that... uh, The Alan Rickman sequence, because he does look... He looked terrified. He, He didn't want to do that, did he? No, he didn't want to do it. And they said, basically, they set up the rig in the studio. They put, obviously, the green screen underneath on the mattress. I think it was a good... I think it was maybe 20 feet, maybe. I'm not sure of the exact height. But they then were doing the countdown. They said, right, we're going to go three, two, one, and go. And they went three, two, and released it. And then the footage you see of uh, Alan Rickman's Hans Gruber is the real fear of, ah, shit, as he's obviously going... um, and yeah, for me, the, not just the cinema nostalgia, just to cap it off, it's the, it would come on on an ITV at home, I've got it, I had it on VHS, I've got it on DVD, I then I've got it on Blu-ray. If, even now, if I see it on TV, I'm going to go, it. oh, you know what? I'm so invading. I've seen my, yeah, go and see my parents. And all of a sudden it's, oh, Die Hard's on, oh, do you fancy? I think I read the book of Die Hard 2 when I was at school. I used to go to the library, sometimes at lunchtime, if it was raining, and go, oh, I'm going to get that book and it's just to hold and feel the artwork and see Bruce Willis's face on the cover and then read through it um, to, yeah, the computer games. To them, yeah, when I went and got myself this uh, ultimate visual history, there's something which I've just invested in. Um, yeah, same with me for Alien. Just, I mean, I bought the book, for H.R. Giga book, The Art of Alien, I think it is. Um, and because I was so, again, so fascinating. It's interesting. A lot of the films we've, we've gone into the top five or quite a few are Jaws, Alien, Blade Runner, Die Hard, uh, they've all passed into popular culture and they're all em- eminently quotable. Lines from Jaws, A Bigger Boat, mm-hmm. a, you know, Alien, um, <coughs> Blade Runner, uh, Die Hard, GPK, I mean, it's just endless, isn't it? And that has affected a lot of other films. They've been so influential, all of them. Absolutely, yeah. And they have been iconic. And again, some people are going, oh, you haven't got your Shawshank Crew, Sits and Canes. This, again, from our point of view, just films that have influenced us. So if we count down, Steve, so we're wrapping there. So you came in with Blade Runner and Mm -hmm. in your fifth place. um, What was four for you? Was it Jaws? I'm struggling to remember myself now. Then you Uh, had Forbidden Planet. Yeah, yeah, sir, and Star Wars. Star Wars, and then you finished on Alien, and for myself, it was in fifth place. I had Stand By Me, followed by The Matrix, followed by Toy Story, followed by The Prestige, and then myself finishing with Die Hards. Um, so that sort of caps off Sci Fi Steve and Diverse Dan's uh, <laughs> set of films. Are they all sci fi? I know Jaws is the only non sci fi I can get out of all of that. Jaws with your, rub- with your rubber sharks. <laughs> Yeah, with a rubber shark. See, I could talk about that all day. Bruce, wasn't it? Because they named the shark after his lawyer or something, didn't they, apparently? Um, the line in there, yeah. which I think I mentioned the other day, you're going to need a bigger boat. Again, a lot of people probably know this, but uh, Roy Scheider ad-libbed that. It wasn't, he came up with that line, um, which is one of those, oh, again, okay. one, yeah, one of those really interesting facts about the film, as is the bit about the Indianapolis speech, which um, a lot of people credited, I think John Milis and, and so on, even Spielberg, but I think, and that it's actually mainly uh, Robert Shaw that came up with that amazing speech. Uh, but anyway, I, di- I digress. You know, yeah, they're all great films. All of them, your selection, my selection. Um, they may, like you say, they may not be Citizen Kane. Um, 
and they may not be but what, uh, what the we always stand by is that film is subjective of course um, it is and whatever if, if it's different people's cup of tea and i've had conversations with people and for me i've never sat and watched a lord of the rings film so obviously we run a group of independent film festivals i studied film i've got a degree in filmmaking i've never watched a lord of the rings films because it's not something which captures my imagination no. um but what we will do now we've done this top five we're then going to come back and do subsequent podcasts. Um, probably we'll do those all in one hit, where we're then probably just going to look at maybe top five uh, actors, um, male, female, potentially look at performances, maybe we'll even look at, which I'd quite like to do, uh, foreign films. Foreign films, that's yeah, yeah, I'd love so, to do that, yeah. So much I love. So we'll wrap up there. Thank you for listening, and we'll be back again um, with our next podcast covering a new topic. Brilliant stuff. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye.